Hit the subscribe button or visit us at auau.auanet.org. Hi everyone, my name is Linda McIntyre, the course director for our second year in a row, diversity, equity, and inclusion in urology, what do we need to know? Our um, instructors today is David Bloom, Pamela Coleman, Tomas Griebling. Oh, it's, it's Jair. Oh, they forgot the R on the last of your name. Santiago Lastra and John Day Smith Mathis. Our learning in Jepkes is to identify why DEI is important and describe the different forms of racism. Um, for uh, attendees to identify their own subconscious personal bias, to identify the impact of race, ethnicity, and gender identification on medical education, and to identify how DEI initiatives can positively, positively impact the practice of urology. So scan the QR code to participate in audience polling questions during the, pre the presentation. I'm gonna leave that up for a second so you can scan it. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna to go to the next slide. So question number one, how might the diversity within the Latinx population impact healthcare outcomes? Number one, it may lead to greater access to healthcare services for all individuals. Number two, it may create challenges in providing culturally and linguistically appropriate care. Number three, it may have no impact on healthcare outcomes. And number four, it may result in increased trust and cooperation between patients and healthcare providers. It would be nice if the answers were up at the same time that people were uh, casting their votes so that they would be able to look at the answers, but I guess not. I can, I can read them for, well, I mean, I think everyone sees them on their screen. Though. Oh, do they? Yeah. Okay, all right. Next question is, efforts to improve diversity and inclusion in urology should, one, include mentorship and development of minority medical students in equitable learning environments. Number two, discontinue pipeline programs because of lack of funding. Number three, discontinue pipeline programs in non-HBCU institutions. And number four, continue to involve Oprah-represented white students. Question number three, the mnemonic vitals is a guide for interpersonal evaluation of biased opinions and ideas, a guide for institutions to implement to ensure diversity at the level of the board of directors, number three, a guide for responding to microaggressions, and number four, a quantitative measure that reflects how many different types there are in a data set.
Okay, our fourth question. Regarding the changing sexual identity demographic of the United States, please choose the correct answer. Number one, with each successive generation, sexual identity has become less fluid and more heteronormative, cisgender. Number two, more than half of LGBTQ Americans are bisexual. Number three, healthcare disparities do not exist for transgender patients. And number four, in 2021, the Census Bureau began to include questions on sexual identity and orientation in its Household Pulse survey. HPS found that 63% of survey respondents were straight. Okay, and finally, our last question, number five. Social determinants of health are the conditions in the places where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect their health, well-being, and quality of life. Examples include safe housing, income, access to healthy food, education, language, and literacy. Social determinants of health drives what percentage of health outcomes? Number one, less than 20%. Number two, 20 to 40%. Number three, 40 to 60%. Number four, 60 to 80%. And number five, greater than 80%. All right, thank you for participating in our pretest session. And now we will have the distinguished David Bloom present the history of race as a unique identifier in the United States. Well, thank you, welcome. I think every year we'll probably have a few more people here each time, <laughs> but it's wonderful to be here and preach to the choir. Uh, let's see if my things, yep. Linda asked me to come here today to talk about something important uh, to us individually and important to us at large as a species, and that is our unique identifiers. Why did she pick me? cronyism, I'm afraid, but I'm grateful for the chance. I'm no health equity scholar, but I do like to look at things from the historical point of view. And these are my disclosures, the things you might want to know about me. But my main disclosure is my belief in the truth, in the truth, a deep belief and something tied into our topic of unique identifiers. I think the arc of the civilized world is globalized, diversified, and democratic. My agenda is threefold. First, as I've explained, my belief in the truth, my disclosure. And second, uh, two questions, and I hope to give you the answers immediately if you have to rush out to another session in this confusing meeting. It is every year this gets bigger and bigger and uh, just finding your way to the speaker ready room and finding your way here and the other, uh, the other things that we end up having to do gets to be a little bit overwhelming, but I'm not getting any younger, so I'm glad to be here this time. Uh, but the other, the two questions I'd ask uh, you to consider, is truth more than an illusion? And my answer is yes. And how do you view human identifiers, that is, our unique identi identities? And my answer is simply the word diversely. And let me explain with the next few slides. 
Don Coffey, the late great scientist at Johns Hopkins, taught his students to learn to tell the difference between facts and true facts. He gave a great talk on human destiny, and that should be a whole other AUA session. But truth is real, especially in these days with lies and confusing uh, claims and artificial intelligence, uh, there, there are real truths. For example, and I've used this slide before, the musical note E5 is a true fact. You can measure it, you can hear it, and most people can agree upon it. And truth has a pleasing harmony, musically, aesthetically, and scientifically in a Euclidean way in this example. And I showed you this larger picture before. It's actually a painting, uh, a picture kind of as big as this wall here. And I saw it last fall when I was in Providence, Rhode Island for Tony Caldemon's retirement and got there a little early. I was confused at that meeting too and uh, went to the Rhode Island School of Design and saw this, this enormous uh, picture. And it's a, a picture of silhouette pictures of hundreds, thousands of real people taken off a website, the Flickr website. And the artist, uh, Penelope Umbrico, who did this in 2011, collated them to make the, the great uh, image, I thought. And there are uncountable identities making up human societies. And I thought that was a good picture to show and, and share with you. Our understanding of the value of each and every person and their uniqueness is one of the newer truths human society has discovered. That's what we now call DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our more primitive species, the other people were our enemies, or at least we thought they were our enemies. They would invade us. They would even invade other countries. You can't believe that would be still happening. But um, there are 110 billion people that came before us, humans, not counting our cousins, our, the other hominid species that we replaced. And there are 8 billion of us now. The 110 billion left us this enormous amount of wisdom and knowledge and facts. And now we have to assemble even more for our successors. And on the right, you'll see a, a slide I made years ago, but I keep coming back to it, the taxa of human knowledge. And it may be a little hard for you to see, but it has the scientific uh, parts. I don't know if this points at all, but on the slide on the right in the lower part, you'll see clinical sciences and then the specialties in urology, pediatric urology where I, I live. Uh, we tend to spend most of our time in that left lower quadrant, but our human problems seem to be overwhelming, and in fact, they are now existential. So my claim is that we need all of our 8 billion to participate in, in perpetuating our species if our species is to survive, and not just the, the 8 billion, uh, the subset of the 8 billion that is the white male that I represent, but the whole eight billion. We need the whole eight billion on board or I don't think we're going to last very long. So my belief in DEI is that it's an existential matter. Fulfillment of each life is the best guarantee for continued human civilization. And that's the role of family. These are some of my grandkids. Uh, the, the, this, those, that's the role of family, society, educational systems, government, religion, etc. That's, that's your role, that's my role. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are fundamental to human survival. And think of what just these three people here, Helen Keller, uh, Thomas Hawking, Trevor Noah, three people marginalized at the start of their lives, just think of what they've added to the human episteome, if, if you will. I sort of came up with that term the other night and thought it might be a little bit pretentious, but it really does seem to fit. 
But just think of with those three alone, and uh, they all needed help. They needed help. They needed some luck. We have trouble, though, classifying ourselves. And I've been spending time in the card files at the University of Michigan for a, a project I'm working on, kind of tracking the old cards of our medical residents over the past century. And unfortunately, we are converting those files to an electronic database. But the, the paper cards have so much little information in them, little marginal notes and pencil, things that won't get transcribed. And, and that's really where the meat of history is. But the old original old cards were three by five cards that, uh, that tracked names, time at the University of Michigan, and the field of study, urology, thoracic surgery, ophthalmology, etc. In 1932, the cards became four by six in size and had a spot for a photo. And I'll show you an example in just a minute. And then in 1977, whoever the dean was decided to add unique identifiers, but they were just initials, B-S-A-O-N, and the candidates circled what they thought applied to them. And then in 1981, the initials were actually spelled out, some of the terms being offensive today, but they were spelled out. And then. In 1986, whatever dean came in, they decided the hell with it. Let's, we don't need any of this stuff. So just the picture was there, or in my case, there was no picture. Nobody asked me for a picture I found when I got my own card out. And in 1995, identifiers came back, I think probably forced by government regulations. And those that were, I'll talk about them in just a little bit, the census data type of human identifiers. And here are the files, and they're all in that cabinet. I don't know what they're going to do with it when they, they finish the, uh, the um, processing to get them on a, a database, but I hope they don't throw them out. I hope they go to a museum somewhere, and there are the cards. So if, if, for example, I decide to move on to another institution, they're going to come and check my files. Well, up until now, they'll go through those cards by hand and see that, oh, in fact, I was at the University of Michigan when I said I was. Uh, on the upper right is one of the actual three by five cards. And then the lower left was my card, but there was no photograph. Although underneath there, somebody checked the box that said, uh, that said Caucasian. I'm, I'm not sure what that means, and that's probably not how I'd describe myself. I haven't investigated what the hell that means, but in any case, it, it was somebody's description of me. And in case it's not clear, I'm the one in the lower right. So, and here are the um, uh, so-called racial categories in the U.S. Census data questionnaire, and I, I wouldn't bother to obsess about it a lot because it will change. But the fine print gets complicated, and. My question for us now is, is, does this minute, granular identification help or hinder our goals for a better and productive society? And I'm afraid the answer is yes and no. Yes, multiple personal identifiers in a database are tools to understand a population and use that, op that information to promote DEI, but no, categorization and racialization of people historically has been a tool used for malign purposes, and that continues today. So there is a real nasty double-edged sword to this. Human classification, I don't need to tell you, has a long and ugly history. We don't have to look very hard in the past or even today to prove that point. So, where do we go from here? Art does help frame our understanding and our choices. And I think Linda's program today for us few, us lucky few, use that great quote from Henry V. I wish I could recite it in the true Shakespearean way. But us lucky few uh, disciples to uh, uh, help guide us. But humanity is built on many identities. We must understand, embrace, 
and maximize each identity and each person. And let me conclude to stay on track because otherwise I at risk of friendship if I exceed my 10 minutes here. But let me conclude with this inspirational, aspirational thought from one American president who said, and I remember hearing this at the time and it really stirred me, we all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children's future, and we are all mortal. And every life, every life needs to contribute meaningfully to our N of human civilization, our 8 billion, if we are to continue on as a species. So that's my claim and I'm sticking to it. So thank you again, Linda, and thank you, hearty few in the audience. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Bloom, for giving us a great talk on the unique race as a unique identifier. Um, well, next go to my talk, I believe, is uh, how do we fight racism, Linda McIntyre. Thank you. So I just want to talk about different ways to address uh, racism. Uh, racism can only be eliminated with a sustained multi-level and interdisciplinary approach. I think, you know, you have to approach racism from different perspectives. Uh, some of the key points to consider is you have to fight racism on a personal level, meaning do a survey of your own uh, implicit bias or self-conscious uh, uh, self-prejudices that you have. You have to fight for future providers or um, make sure that we embed cultural competency in medical school education. Fight for our current providers, making sure that current physicians are up to date with cultural competency and respect for others. And fight on an institutional level. I love this slide with Oprah Winfrey that says that we can't become what we need to be by remaining who we are. We live in a society that's constantly evolving and as society evolves, it's our personal responsibility to evolve as well. Um, <clears throat> on a personal level, um, we can employ steps to prevent personal acts of microaggression and implicit bias on our part. One is to notice the person or notice the patient or notice the individual. That means immediately quiet your brain's assumptions. We all have assumptions that we have about people that sometimes <coughs> kick in even before we've had an interaction with that individual. And lean in with empathy. And my good friend Anita Tachandani told me to use more antidotes. And I would say that one of my pet peeves or something that kind of scares me is the dirty fingernails and cuticles and hands. And I remember seeing a patient and I just looked across the room. I had to go consent the patient and I saw that hand. I was like, oh Lord, help me God, help me. And I just stood there for a moment, gathered myself and realized that this was a 19 year old Amish boy who's a hard worker and was there for me to help him. And I got myself together and leaned in with my heart when I talked to him. And that's the important thing is that we all have our thing or our assumptions or our bias or um, the things that bother us, but we have to quiet that and learn to lean in with our hearts when we're dealing with patients because they're there for us to help them. Um, it might seem simple, but it, it's a good thing to practice. Uh, recognize the role of structural racism and how it may impact this individual. Um, uh, you know, why is this individual acting this way or why are they in this situation and understand that there are factors, mitigating factors much bigger than this interaction. Abandon the notion of colorblindness and adopt multiculturalism. Colorblindness is a form of racism and we have to accept that people are different, acknowledge their differences, appreciate and respect them. Um, dare, 
decide how to be your best self. I skipped believe your patient. And I credit Tracy Downs for this because believe your patient, there's a type of epistemic injustice that Tracy talks about where the knower is discredited. And a lot of times people of color or marginalized groups go to the doctor and feel that they aren't believed and have to overcompensate in order to get the patient, get the provider to believe them. And it's a simple thing to just believe your patient, to do whatever is necessary in order to corroborate what the patient is telling you. And then the last thing is, don't go on the defensive when you're corrected. None of us are perfect and use it as an opportunity to grow and learn. And that's on a personal level. Um, on this personal level, there, this particular study utilized a program where they randomized white physicians to either getting interpersonal growth assistance or not getting it. And they put the doctors into racially charged patient-provider interactions. So the, there was a group that got interpersonal growth and help, how to avoid uh, microaggressions, and there was a group that didn't. And an example of that is, is that you have a patient where the patient says, I would have gotten a call back if I was white. And there's five different ways to respond to that. And one way that you can respond to a racially charged situation is if you say, no, you wouldn't, or race doesn't have anything to do with it. You just made that situation worse. The other way is to say, you know, I apologize that you didn't get a call back. I will look into it. And that's forming a trust relationship with the patient. And they actually found in this study that those white physicians or providers who who got trust, I mean, who got training in learning how to deal with racially charged interactions with patients actually did better than the ones that didn't. So it's a it's a learning process that we can all grow and evolve. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And this is uh, helpful to think about allyship and responding to microaggressions. And with responding to microaggressions, we have to learn to take the vitals. And with vitals, I love this template because if you've ever been a victim of microaggressions, the first thing that happens is your heart rate goes up and you become tachycardic and you may actually just kind of become dumbfounded and not be able to say anything because you're so stunned that this is happening to you at that very moment. And what the vitals does is it gives you a way to kind of breathe, slow down, and take this information in. And then the V is for validate. Validate this experience. Like, is this really happening? Like, I'm not losing my mind. Did this person really say that? And then the I is to inquire. What did you just say? Before you even respond to it, or can you repeat that again? To inquire about the situation. The other one is to take time, because we don't want to fly off the handle, but take time to kind of process what's going on. Um, L is for leave an opportunity to discuss this. Maybe we can follow up and talk about this later. And then number the, the S is for speak up, and that's the allyship. Sometimes a person is so knocked off their socks when they're a victim of a microaggression or racial assault that they need the person around them to be an ally for them. And a friend of mine was on a skiing trip, and my friend is a, a CMO of a huge medical uh, organization and she was on a skiing trip in Vail and was the victim of a microaggression and it was her white colleagues who helped her come out of that stunned moment by being an ally for her at that particular time and so I think that if we're quiet when we uh, when we witness these things then we kind of perpetuate them and next is the function of freedom is to free someone else and I love this is that Toni Morrison conceptualizes freedom in a calculus, in a calculus form, formula that freedom actually has a function. And so I took this quote and I wanted to apply diversity and inclusion to it. And I looked at it and I said the function of organizational diversity is to ensure 
organizational diversity, not just at that moment, but ongoing, or the function of inclusion, or the function to be included, is to include someone else. That is not just the prideful thing that I'm the first black or the only woman. Okay, well, let's see who else you're gonna get coming through the door. What other marginalized group, what other, what other person needs an opportunity? So for medical students, um, you, we can dismantle racism by teaching social determinants of health, barriers to health care for underrepresented groups, uh, structural racism in medical school curriculum for all allied health professionals. And I was really excited when I went to the AAMC's website and found this article addressing healthcare disparities in the LGBTQ community. Like, wow, you know, that kind of resource was not available to us when we were in medical school. And the AAMC has so much on the LGBTQ curriculum incorporated it into medical school education for students and for medical schools across the country to incorporate into there. And this is important because, you know, as we treat more patients, we need to be um, more fluent in, in the best way to take care of our patients. Uh, for, for, for current providers, uh, using technology to put reminders in the electronic health uh, record that it extracts social determinants of health. And an example of that is if you have a 56-year-old black male and he's your patient, a reminder comes up, check his PSA. Why? Because those age ranges are different for black men. Um, and also, um, continuing medical education and that provides courses on diversity. Um, and as you know, um, my friend Anita Tachandani was listening to NPR and she called me with an emergency. And she said, Linda, learning systems and artificial intelligence can be bad. And she, you know, she brought up this article, and this is a coalition of the Vector Institute at the University of Toronto and MIT where Dr. Kasimi says that you can use uh, deployable learning systems and then what you do is is that the only thing that you change is the race and i'll go to the next slide so that you can see it better you you change the race and then you allow these deployable learning systems to finish the sentence in artificial intelligence so with a caucasian or white patient became belligerent or violent, the patient was sent to the hospital, whereas where an African or African-American or black patient became belligerent and violent, the patient was sent to prison. And why does this exist? And that's because artificial intelligence draws on existing data, which is permeated with structural, structural racism. And the next slide, Dr. Kasimi goes through from the beginning to the end of problem selection to post-deployment considerations of all the different things that need to be done in order to ensure justice from artificial intelligence. Because there's structural racism in education and housing and in, in everything. And so when you're drawing from existing data that's tainted or people are tainted or viewed in a certain way or treated in a certain way, then those are the results that you're gonna get. The other um, thing that's available to current providers is quality interactions. This is from uh, Dr. Bentcourt at MI, uh, Mass General. And this is a, people like me that live in Michigan have to take this and um, they have, you know, over a thousand cultural competency cases that you can take in order to improve your abilities. Um, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. And this is often attributed to Aristotle, but really it's Will Durant who interprets Aristotle to say this, and this quote is commonly used when we talk about quality. And this goes to, um, we have to fight on an organizational level. And rather than to read this to you, I just want you to understand that Within an organization, if a disparity exists, that's a quality issue. And so if a function of organizational diversity is to ensure organizational diversity, then some things have to change. And when you look at two 
groups having a disparity and it's a quality issue, it should be treated like any other quality issue within an organization. And it should be also applauded when that disparity is erased. So in conclusion, racism can be attacked on many levels, personal, uh, future providers, current providers, and institutional with the recognition of the problem, being transparent about the problem, being accountable to change the problem, and having a diverse staff at multiple levels within an institution to address the problem. Thank you. So we'll go to our next talk, Dr. Jair Santiago Lastra. Well, welcome to all of you who are participating here. I think one um, important thing about doing work in health equity is that it really is something that um, consistency is definitely rewarded. And a lot of times health equity is very much siloed. And what that means is that, yes, they have us teaching a course on equity, diversity, inclusion, <coughs> Um, when really it has to be intermixed in the fabric of everything else that's going on at the meeting. And so um, what, I would, what I take as a takeaway when these things happen is that every opportunity that you have to integrate it into the fabric of what you do is another takeaway that someone is integrating into their work and that's how we make gains. And so sometimes it can seem deflating if it's not garnering the interest that, say, a plenary session on prostate cancer might integrate. But as we start to discuss this with more and more people and our demographics start to change, then the attention is shifted and we can, we can integrate. So we're going to talk a little bit about Latinos, Latinx patients. Um, my objective, if someone could turn on the timer, because we're doing a little, we're, um, a little slow on the time, and I should have um, 10 minutes. Thank you for giving me 13, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about Latino patients, health equity, and some ways to operationalize it. These are my disclosures. I don't have any financial disclosures, but obviously I um, see the world through the lens of my unique background, and we all do. And so Dr. Bloom gave us a mandate to always tell the truth, but we always have to remember that the truth is not just what we see and what we've lived. There are many experiences that come into the fabric of the truth and not one single person owns that truth. So we do always have to tell the truth. We don't know all of it, so we then have to listen and, and be allies so that we can be successful. And we also know that the racial and ethnic demographics in the United States and in the world are changing. But what's important in the United States is that by 2050, whites will no longer be the majority in the country. And no healthcare system is going to feel this um, more uh, intensely than the healthcare system. And the reason for that is that concordant care and care that is knowledgeable about the cultural and racial demographics of the patients that we serve is going to be more effective. And we already know our healthcare system is struggling, and it's struggling not just financially, but also in its outcomes. And so in order to embrace that change with a population that's changing, we really need to understand the patients that we're serving and some of the structural forces that keep them from their best health. So let's talk a little bit about the term Latinx because it is very controversial. Uh, I can tell you that in my family, it is not a preferred term, and I actually use it interchangeably. When I do um, become very emphatic about using it is, for example, in research or if I'm giving a talk like this one, um, because Latinx does have something about it that um, makes it more inclusive, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And it's always great to err on the side of inclusivity um, in order to make everyone feel involved in what you're discussing. Um, but it is true that you can't just come up with a term and expect people to use it. So there's a bunch of controversy about it. You may have seen it all around social media. Um, they, words have a huge job to do, and words do matter. Um, one interesting thing, I'll notice that uh, somebody uh, actually started this year the Hispanic Urological Association of North America 
our urological society. And you know, I thought it was really interesting that they chose the term Hispanic. Um, and it can be an example of truth being what someone experiences, but yet um, maybe not using a term that someone else feels is inclusive. And so we can get caught up in this language battle for quite a bit, but let's not focus so much on, okay, are we gonna use Hispanic? Are we gonna use Latinx? And let's really look at why this controversy of words happened and why are Latinos such a heterogeneous and complex population? Let's look at that history. So where did it come from? So uh, Dr. Bloom alluded to this a little bit in his talk, but if you look back in the 1960s and you just looked at the census report, you probably wouldn't know at that time that there was actually a very sizable and growing Latinx community as we know it today. And the reason was that really you could just choose to be white and non-white. And here they have Negro as the designation. So what happened during that time is that there were a bunch of political groups um, uh, orchestrated by community organizers that started to notice that there were some similarities between um, people who were coming from Latin American countries on the East Coast and people who were coming from Latin American countries on the West Coast with regards to labor, with regards to um, uh, enfranchisement, with regards to um, immigration, and all of these topics and they said, hey, there's power in organization. Let's organize ourselves into one contingent. And a lot of words were thrown around, la raza, hispano, latino, and the Nixon organization chose Hispanic. And so Hispanic denotes a more like colony uh, mentality um, and the word comes from Spain. But Latinx also includes other um, countries in Latin America and it also includes more languages and it also includes um, a bit more fluidity in gender. And so from Latino, which is gendered, Latino, Latina, uh, came Latinx and that is where we are today. And so um, even Latinx has its own uh, drawbacks, right? It's not, the X is not a word that is common in Spanish, although it is a very um, indigenous word. So I would argue that even when people say, oh, this is language imperialism, you're forcing your American language on Spanish language. Actually, no, the X is an indigenous word and it has an S sound, Latinx, so chill and all of those words. So actually, um, there, you know, language is really interesting and we could probably talk about this for a long time and look at the historical context be behind the word, but that is where we are today. And so even that word doesn't really explain all of the variability and heterogeneity in the Latino population when we talk about um, healthcare outcomes. And so looking at Latinx as an ethnicity, any study that you see looking at Latinos without really defining where those Latinos are coming from and what their backgrounds are is not a study that is done adequately because Latinos are very heterogeneous. All of us could be Latinos depending on where we lived and came from. That is how racially and demographically diverse that population is. So there's something called the Latino health paradox, and it has to do with why Latinos have such poor health outcomes in some studies and such excellent health care outcomes in other studies. And it really has to do with what Latino population are you testing? Are they underserved? Are the social determinants of health, of health at play here? Um, what are their racial, um, what is their racial diversity, et cetera? And so when we discuss race and ethnicity as, as risk factors in any study for any race, we have to view them through the lens of the social determinants of health. And we can see all of these different barriers and important factors that will play into um, outcomes for the Latino population. There are a lot of studies that have been published. Let's go um, a little further. Um, the true determinants are not the Latinx ethnicity, but the following variables. And we can see some examples here. These are really strong variables. And so when you, if you're thinking about doing research and looking at a specific community, or if you're thinking about improving outcomes for your hospital or healthcare system or your clinic, and you want to improve delivery of care for Spanish speaking patients, this is um, an example of variables that are really going to play into that. 
25% of all U.S. Latinos identify as Afro-Latino. This is very important. We're going to talk about that a little bit. They're more likely to be Latinos with roots in the Caribbean if they are Afro-Latino, but not necessarily universally so. They're more likely to be Latinos living on the East Coast, but certainly there is a migration that is happening, a migration into rural America. And so that is something that's gonna be really interesting as that plays out over the next few decades. And they're more likely to report family incomes before $30,000 a year. So the Afro-Latinx or the Afro-Latino um, cultural designation is really important as well, not just because it's a quarter of all US Latinos identity, but also because there's been an erasure of the African identity in Latin America. There are multiple di dimensions of this colonial history that are really important. Um, one thing I'll emphasize is that, for example, until 2016, Mexicans were not able to identify as Afro-Mexicano in their census, and so there was really no real um, understanding of the population of Mexicans of African descent in, in Mexico until very recently. When that was added to the census, you had two million Afro-Mexicanos pop up in the country. And so that is, that is astounding. And only now are we starting to understand that. Similar things are happening in Argentina. Similar things are happening in Peru, which has a really strong African musical history, for example. And um, in the Caribbean, well, it goes without saying um, that that is a, a rich part of the identity. And so that means we're everywhere. And those who don't see Latinos or don't see Latinos or Afro-Latinos in their midst are probably not looking properly. And that is one of the most important things about discussing Latinos. If we are, for example, discussing how to improve diversity in our recruitment of Latino physicians, we need to really look at what Latino physicians are we, are we having apply? Are we um, having white, uh, passing Latinos who come from affluent families, or are we really looking at a diverse, rich background of Latinos of many, um, and not just Afro-Latino, but also Afro-Indigenous or indigenous Latinos? And these are the top 10 US metropolitan areas by Hispanic population. We're not gonna go into that because I'm running out of a little bit of time and I do want to, because um, we're running a little behind. And so one important thing that I emphasize is that Latinx in the US have heterogeneous origins. And that is really important because they differ greatly from one another. So Latinos in California are gonna be different from Latinos in Texas, different from Latinos on the West Coast, and they're usually grouped together, again, because there's political power in that grouping, but there may, may be nuances there that we have to look into with healthcare that we're not gonna see with the political contingent. And we see that all the time, the Latino vote, are they gonna vote pro-abortion or pro this or pro that? And it's, it really depends on their cultural and community background. So how do those social determinants of health play out in California's Latinx community? And that's the takeaway that I'm gonna leave you with. And I'm gonna move forward a little bit um, and we talked a little bit about language and that they're not only the, the, not the only factor. So some patients, and especially Latinos, have a very strong Spanish cultural history. Many of them do not speak English, and so that can be a barrier. But I want to talk about change making. So these are all of those barriers, language barriers, unique beliefs and values, and we can go over these a little bit more um, in the small groups. But I wanted to go over how we change those inequities. Let's go over here. So with poverty, employment, and healthcare, there were some humongous shifts in the demographics and humongous shifts in access to care with the COVID-19 pandemic. And so how do we reach these patients, for example, to get them vaccinated or to access care for prostate cancer or to access care for stress incontinence? And so we're gonna move forward a little bit to look at that into promotores. And the reason I chose to skip some of the other things and emphasize promotores is that a lot of times in health equity courses, we talk about the population, the challenges, and we don't talk about how we level those challenges and actually make it 
uh, simplified way to reach patients and to deliver them the better outcomes. So we start to um, understand the implicit biases, we understand the barriers to care, but we don't understand how to fix them. So one way that is evidence-based that has really helped reach the Spanish-speaking Latinx community, not just in one area, but actually across the United States, has been using Promotores de Salud and its community health workers. And this doesn't just work for Latinos, it works for a lot of communities. These are people embedded within communities that have fabric of care within the community and they are trained specifically regarding certain disease states and they help recruit patients and help patients bridge the gap between the healthcare system, which can be really um, ostracizing and really confusing and really um, discriminatory towards patients, and then helps them understand how to navigate the healthcare process in a way that works for them. And um, this is an example of something we've done with the, through the Changemaker Fellowship with the use of Promotores de Salud. But obviously the, health, the elephant in the room is that also the expenses of healthcare and the unaffordability of treatments and the lack of coverage for certain treatments affects the patients most of all. And so we wanna look at the social determinants of health carefully when we're doing that. And these are some of those takeaway messages um, based on the discussion. And I'm looking forward to talking more with, about that um, in the small groups as well. Thank you. Okay, so at this point, since we have so many people here, what I'd like to do is, is split the room up into um, <clears throat> Christina, if you could join Janelle on this side, and and then Anita, and you guys come up to Dr. Roach, come up a little bit closer, and we're gonna do a small group exercise. Um, so Christina's gonna go over to Janelle. Can you join them back there? And can you come a little bit further? And then for the instructors, split yourself up and join one side or the other side. And I'm gonna pass out uh, vitals, and then what we'll do is we'll have a racial microaggression within the group, and I want you within the group to go through the vitals together. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Queensland. Pacific Beach. Do you like it? Yeah. And the schools are good.
Okay, guys, um, I, I hate it. Um, I know the best part of this course is the small group exercise because we get to talk about these issues and we get to apply some of the principles that we learned and we get to hear from our colleagues about their thoughts and their perceptions. But we have some other speakers that we need to uh, go through because we only have the room for a certain time. And I really thank you so much for participating. And we have another small group session coming up and that's gonna be on microaggressions towards LGBTQ, which should be exciting. Oh, not exciting, but you know what I mean, provocative. I mean provocative is what I meant to say. Okay, so now I'd like to call uh, Dr. John J. Smith Mathis, 
and she's going to talk to us about structural racism. Impact and Solutions. Dr. Smith Mathis. All right, so the topic of my talk was modified just a little bit because once I started working on the slides, this was kind of the, um, the direction um, it was headed. Uh, these are, oh, I think I skipped my disclosures um, slides. I have none. I'm just me. Um, these are the objectives, um, and we'll kind of cover all of this um, as we go along. I need to pull this back a little bit. So we'll start with the definition of social determinants of health. SDOH, um, these are the conditions in the places where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age um, that have huge impact on um, health outcomes health outcomes and quality of life. And the graphic to the right um, shows the different domains of the social determinants of health. Uh, this chart just shows you some examples um, of some of the things that fall under each of those domains. And so you can see from looking at this chart, um, you know, why these things would have an impact on health outcomes. Now, as far as impact of SDOH, the medical care that we provide to patients really only accounts for 10 to 20 percent of the modifiable contributors to health outcomes. The other 80 to 90 percent, that's actually due to the social determinants of health. So starting with some definitions, health disparities are the difference, uh, differences in health outcomes between groups that, are, that reflect social inequalities. And then health equity is the principle underlying our commitment to reduce these disparities in health. An unmet social need is the lack of basic resources like food, safe housing, transportation. SDOH and unmet social needs contribute to these health disparities um, that we speak of. But what exactly, what's the root cause of health disparities? Uh, because often this discussion always leads back to social determinants of health. But let's get to the root cause. And the way we do that is by asking why. So why are health disparities associated with SDOH? Because of unequal allocation and distribution of power and resources. Well, why do we have an equal allocation of dis um, and distribution of power and resources? Structural racism. And the definition here is taken from the CDC website. I added the directly and indirectly um, in the brackets there. But structural racism is a system of policies, practices, and norms that directly and indirectly assigns values and determine opportunity based on the way people look or the color of their skin. So let's talk a little bit more about structural racism um, as the root cause. So we have our definition from the previous slide. It results in conditions that unfairly advantage and disadvantage some. Our second bullet there, that's our social determinants of health. The third bullet looks at our SDOH domains Preventing people from attaining their highest level of health, that's uh, affecting health equity. And this leads to higher rates of poor health outcomes in disadvantaged groups, that's our health disparities. I put this slide up just as an example of um, some of the um, responses that we get when speaking of the impact of structural racism on health. Well, some people don't work hard enough or some patients are just not compliant and don't care about their health. Well, let's talk about some historical context here. And I'll just briefly run through some of these. If we look at the Social Security Act of 1935, this was designed to help people get continuing income after retirement. But because agricultural and domestic workers were excluded 
for at least the first 15 years, that means two thirds of the working African American population was excluded during that time. Looking at the GI Bill, again, a program that at face value should not be discriminatory. It was a federal program, but it was administered by the VA at the state and local level. level. So because racial and gender discrimination was so prevalent, that meant that African Americans and women oftentimes did not receive the benefits even when they qualified. And the last example, redlining. This was an inst institutionalized by the federal um, government. Neighborhoods were color coded to help mortgage lenders um, determine the risk um, for defaulting on loans. And the neighborhoods that were redlined were typically older districts, typically minority neighborhoods. Um, and even when the banks did give these folks loans, they were usually horrible, horrible loans, high interest rates and whatnot. And you can look at this slide and say, well, John Jay, but that ended in 1968. So what does that have to do with 2023? Well, this study from 2018 looked at the impact of redlining. And they looked at current neighborhoods that were redlined um, between the 1930s and 1960s. And what they found that is that there were huge economic, educational, and health implications. And these are just three examples um, for these neighborhoods. And in fact, when we look in specifically at the health you know, implications, these were the same neighborhoods that have higher um, incidences of the chronic diseases that were risk factors for COVID-19. So it all is connected. So let's slow down and just think about a non-compliant patient. So we have this 43-year-old guy who's a frequent flyer, he's neurogenic bladder, he's supposed to do intermittent catheterization, but this guy keeps coming back with urosepsis. And you see him and you're frustrated because he is just not doing his catheterizations. And then you talk to the patient and you realize he's uninsured, so he cannot afford the Dagon catheters. He is poorly, um, he's not, his diabetes is not well controlled and he's, he's overweight, but he's, he lives in a place where there, there are really no safe places to exercise. He's like, my neighborhood's not safe, I can't walk um, safely in my neighborhood, there's no gym, I can't work out, I can't lose the weight. He lives in a food desert, no access to healthy foods. And he was laid off a year ago and he is working as an Uber driver, so he really is struggling. So is this person just not compliant and doesn't care about his health? Or is it truly his reality is the cards are just stacked against him? So let's um, spend the last few minutes just talking about SDOH and urology. This is a hot topic. This was just, this is just a handful of papers from the last couple of years. It's the, it's the new hot ticket, like everyone's talking about it. There are numerous studies showing associations between SDOH and unmet social needs and neurological conditions and the benefits of doing all of these um, screens. But is it feasible to do in your clinic? If you're like me and you have 15 minute appointments for every single patient coming in the door, new or established, do you have time to screen? So this is a feasibility study. This was a group in Charlotte, North Carolina, and they screened patients to see if this was something they could work into their workflow. So they, they piloted um, this uh, program based on the WeCare model, which is a pediatric SDOH um, screening and referral program where the patients complete the screen in the waiting room. They have community resource information available, and they have navigators who can help connect patients with local resources. So this group looked at 80 patients, 40 per clinic, um, in December of 2021. This is the screening tool that they used, and there are lots of those out there. I, the box on the bottom is just to draw attention to an important piece with any of these tools. Just because a patient 
tells you they have an unmet need does not necessarily mean that they want your help. So we have to give patients the autonomy and the agency to accept or decline whatever help we have. So that's the red box on the corner is, do you want any help for the needs that you have identified here? Uh, this just shows their workflow. So the way they did it was the questionnaires were given to the patients in the waiting room while they're waiting to see the doc. Patients completed the questionnaires. Um, folks who needed interpreters, because one of their um, clinics had a high uh, percentage of Spanish-speaking patients, um, interpreters would help with the questionnaires. The nurse or MA who roomed the patient entered that information into the um, into the EMR, similar to when review of systems were needed for E&M coding, and your nurse or MA would enter the RS information into the EMR, so same thing. So they just used that time uh, to answer this information. Um, they had uh, community resource sheets available with information for local resources, and that LCI develop, program development specialist, they used nurse navigators from their cancer center um, in this pilot program. So this slide just shows the patient demographics from the two clinics. Um, key takeaway points, points are that the clinic number two had a larger proportion of black, Hispanic, and uninsured patients. And in this slide, we see um, they, had, they observed a high burden of need among the patients, particularly those in clinic two. Across both patients, uh, 24 of the 80, so about 30%, screened positive for um, at least one need. And more than half of the patients who screened positive actually requested help from the um, navigator. Uh, the most frequently indicated needs were food in insecurity and housing. This is a busy one. All it, um, the, the takeaway points here are that when they surveyed their staff, 100% um, of the respondents of their staff agreed or strongly agreed that this was, um, that the screening was valuable and allowed them to better understand their patients. Um, however, their concern was that it would take too much time. Interestingly, when they went back and checked to see how much time it took to enter this information into the EMR, it took about one minute. Uh, but the concern about time was a big, was a big one. So, Let's bring this in for landing. What can you do in your practice um, as far as um, SDOH and unmet social needs? Start by asking the question. And it can be as simple as, what is the biggest challenge you faced in doing intermittent catheterization? It can be that simple. It doesn't have to be a 20-item 20 quest 20 questionnaire. Now, if you are in an institution that has the ability to roll out um, a screening tool, then by all means, um, do the tool. But also, like we talked about earlier, do not assume that everyone with an unmet social need wants your help. So don't forget to ask that question. And then important to have resources available. Because why are you asking the question if you're not gonna do anything about it? You know, this is not just an exercise in showing that you care. It has to, the end result has to be that we're able to help the patients who need help. So findhelp.org is an excellent website. So even if your institution does not have resources available, or if you're in private practice and don't have access to resources, it is literally a website where you type in your zip code, so you have the patient type in their zip code, and it provides um, access to free and reduced um, services in, the, in that zip code. Um, the other thing that, you know, is create information sheets, just, what are, what's the contact information and street address for a local food pantry or shelter, um, and just have that available. So again, if you're asking the question, you have some resources that you can provide to patients. And then having support staff. Um, if, you know, again, not always possible, I understand funding, 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 but you know, social workers, case managers, um, any support staff that you have that could help patients navigate this process. Because let's say someone needs to apply for, apply for housing. 
Sometimes just the application process alone is very daunting for some patients. So having support staff that can help a patient kind of access an application and complete it could really make a difference in whether, that, whether or not that person goes through the process. And finally, um, systemic problems need systemic solutions. So this is not something, you know, yes, we can do things in our clinic and you can do something in an institution, but, you know, looking back to the slide um, with the historical context where there are systemic reasons and structural reasons as to why some of the problems we're dealing with exist. Um, so it has to be part of that solution. And that includes things like advocacy and public um, private partnerships and community engagement. Community engagement is an important piece because you, again, we don't want to assume that we know how to address the problem without engaging the people who are directly impacted by the problems that we're trying to solve. So very important piece. I'll leave you with this graphic. So, you know, when you're dealing with individual patients and their problems, you're kind of working in that downstream um, area and um, addressing those unmet social needs, your downstream, midstream, we really also should not forget the importance of the upstream work. Um, and that's, you know, the advocacy piece. So final take home message here. Um, remember that health disparities reflect social inequities. Um, and thinking back to the root cause, which is structural racism, health equity does not happen by default. It won't happen just because we want it to happen and that's what we know should happen. It has to be actively pursued and actively, and we have to be intentional in our efforts to achieve um, health equity. Um, screening for unmet social needs is feasible in a urology practice. Like I said, it can be a screening tool, it can be a simple question, and just think outside of the box about ways to ask the questions and ways to have resources available for your patients, like findhelp.org. Simple. Throw that in the after-visit summary um, if your patient has an unmet need. And finally, please, 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 when you see that next patient who is non-compliant, and that's plastered all over the chart. This patient never follows through with recommendations. Just try to maybe take a step back and take a breath before you go into that room and remember to ask, think of what question you could ask that could help you understand why that patient is not compliant. It could, and it could be something that you could really do to make an impact for that person. And some resources here for you. And if you're interested in book recommendations, those are some really, really good books um, on these topics. I've enjoyed all four of these and more, and um, hope you do too. That's all I have. Thank you. OK. Um, we're in a real crunch for time. We have two talks and one. Um, group discussion to go. So Thomas, would you come and give us your talk, please? And um, try to keep it to 10 minutes if you can. I appreciate it so that we can do our group discussion and make sure that Dr. Coleman gets a chance to do our talk. No, go ahead. Do your, I mean, after, after my talk, are we going to do the exercise? Uh -huh. Okay, great. Yep. Okay, great. Um, thanks, uh, Dr. McIntyre. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to join the faculty this year um, and to look at issues related to gender identity and LGBTQ um, issues. I'm at the University of Kansas. My subspecialty is in female pelvic medicine and reconstruction, uh, and I also have a strong interest and in, uh, work in geriatric urology. Um, the educational objectives for this session are to describe gender identity and related terminology. We're going to discuss how these factors influence urologic health care. I'm going to present a brief timeline of the civil rights movement related to lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and um, questioning or queer population and understand how they relate to health care that we provide, and then list some resources that are available for additional education and work. 
So um, I think we often think of these terms as being something that's, that's sort of, you know, we understand what all of them are, but there's some very subtle differences. So sex has generally meant the biology of male or female whereas gender is a social construct, and it relates to the behaviors and experiences that people have based on their sex or their sexual identity. And this can vary by culture and society. Often these are felt to be binary. You're either male or you're female. You're either masculine or you're feminine, et cetera. But we know that this really exists across the spectrum. And I think we as urologists, at least I hope, have a little bit more insight because we're familiar with all of the intersex disorders, um, which really show that this is on a spectrum and is not necessarily a binary um, a, a entity. Um, one of the things we have to think about, and you'll hear people talk about heteronormative, and heteronormative means that there are presumptive norms in most society that heterosexuality is the natural or normal sort of existence. Um, and a lot of the work that we're doing now in DEI is to try to help uh, combat that. It's based on patriarchal models. Many of them have religious or cultural foundations. And it's really limiting in scope in how we think about all of this and can be very dismissive of variations. The term gender expression means how one presents themselves in the world in relation to their sex or to their gender. And then we're hearing a lot about transsexual or transgender health. This is where the gender identity and expression that an individual has may not match their biological sex or their identified gender. An older term in psychiatry was gender dysphoria, that people felt um, unhappy or upset or somehow bothered by that. I think that's a little bit older term, especially as we start looking at gender affirming healthcare and really trying to uh, have this in a positive rather than as an, in a negative light. Um, we know there's a wide range of expression in transgender um, existence, and I talked about intersex. Sexual orientation. In traditional sort of, again, binary mode, we think of people as being either straight or gay, but again, we understand that this is across a spectrum, and bisexual people who are attracted to both sexes, or a term that I don't know if many people have heard is pansexual, where people are attracted essentially to everyone, and don't necessarily self-identify in any of those other categories. There are also some other types of attraction, which we don't hear a lot about, but things like demisexual. People that identify as demisexual need to have some type of emotional connection to the person that they're engaged in sexual activity with in order to really have a sexual connection. Um, and then asexual people, and this doesn't just mean people who don't have sex, there are some other variations in this, but people who may have um, a lower sexual attraction or lower sex drive. Well, what's the influence of these? Certainly we know that it can influence establishing trust and rapport. People, especially in the LGBT community have, um, and there's a lot of research and a lot of data showing that there's often a lack of trust as there have been issues in other racial and ethnic groups uh, with healthcare and the healthcare industry. The goal is really empathic and compassionate care and a respect for the patient and the clinician dyad uh, in trying to build that trust and build those relationships. This relates to basic human rights. So the patients and the clinicians, the rights of loved ones to help provide uh, their input for care, and what we do in terms of education and our trainees. We wanna make sure that people get good training in these topics, and that we also respect the identity of our colleagues, our professionals, and the people that are in training. Um, the importance of engaging the entire healthcare team, and I think we'll talk about that a little bit in the exercises. Certainly we wanna build a culture of quality and care. And that's true in clinical settings, in educational settings, in research, in funding, and of course non-discrimination policies, some of which are at government levels, some are at institutional levels. A lot of this will influence many things. The degree of outness that people have. I mean, I, when I was in my training, and again, from a socially you know, developed time, was a different time. 15, 20 years ago. But at that time, I could never in my lifetime imagine that I would be out as a professional, um, as a urologist. And now it's simply part of my identity that I'm very proud of. Um, and then what is someone's comfort in discussing all of these different factors? 
The role of language is incredibly important, and you heard other speakers talk about this earlier. Language is deeply held and often very ingrained. For example, masculine and feminine spectrum is a good example. You'll see a lot now about pronouns and people talking about which pronouns they use. These are self-chosen, but they could also be implied or assigned. And really, we want people to be able to choose the, the pronouns that they resonate with that are comfortable. They tend to fall into she and her, he and him, or they and them. Pronouns by themselves do not represent other aspects. So because someone chooses they and them does not necessarily that mean that they have a gay sexual orientation. There are all sorts of variations among this. Uh, and again, various types of attraction. The word queer has been controversial. Um, in the past, many years ago, it was considered very derogatory and was a very negative term. And our community has, over time, and in large part, I think, because of gay youth, re-embraced this term and now use it as a badge of pride. People identify with a queer sense of identity. Um, and again, we're taking back language. I'm going to talk very briefly about a timeline related to LGBTQ issues because I think it informs what we're experiencing now. So there are records of same-sex relationship and attraction that go back basically to the beginning of recorded human history. Um, and ancient cultures we know about in Egypt and Greece and Italy and things that have an accepted same-sex relationship. Native American culture often accepts and embraces that, whereas other cultures have not. I'm going to start really in the 30s and 40s, so just before World War II. There was certainly a persecution of gay men and lesbians during World War II in the Nazi regime. Many are familiar with the symbol of the pink triangle. The pink triangle, like the yellow star of David, was applied to uniforms of people in concentration camps. And gay men were identified with the pink triangle because they thought it was an effeminate symbol. Uh, lesbian women were identified with the black triangle on their uniform. But what's interesting is we think of, you know, sort of the liberation of the camps. When D-Day happened, although they were liberated from the concentration camps, many of those people went back directly into prison because the American system and the Russian system from the Allies still considered homosexuality as a crime. And so many of those people really weren't truly free. 1948 and 1953, Alfred Kinsey from the um, uh, Sexual uh, Health Institute at Indiana University released his um, groundbreaking research. And it was really the first scientific research in this country that identified a large number of people identifying on a sexual spectrum and really sort of quantified the number of people that identify as gay or lesbian. In the 60s, uh, then Masters and Johnson continued that work, and of course, we had the development of the sexual revolution. Really, one of the groundbreaking areas is the Stonewall Riots, and the Stonewall Riots occurred in 1969 in New York City. It was about a week of rioting by patrons of a small gay bar uh, in the village in New York City. Um, at that time, police raids were very common on these places where people gathered. And that particular night, the group said, we've had it, we're done. And the thing that's interesting about it is it was the majority of people that were there were lesbians, uh, immigrants, people of color, and drag queens who stood up and said, we're tired of it, we're not going to take it. And they fought back, and it's considered really the hallmark of the beginning of the gay rights movement. The Gay Liberation Front continued this in the 70s, and a groundbreaking change in 1973 was that the American Psychiatric Association removed homosexuality from their diagnoses of psychiatric conditions. So it was no longer considered a psychiatric illness. The Pride flag was debuted in 78, then of course we had the entire AIDS epidemic and crisis into the 1980s. Ryan White Care Act 1990, which started getting funding for HIV and um, AIDS care. And then in 1993, Don't Ask, Don't Tell was created. And it's interesting because the goal initially of Don't Ask, Don't Tell was to protect, protect military um, people in the military from being discharged. But what ended up happening was it was used sort of as a witch hunt for people. And over 100,000 veterans were discharged, and the vast majority of them discharged with other than honorable discharge, which then excluded them from pension, from health care, and from a lot of the other um, benefits that they'd potentially get. 
This was subsequently removed in 2010. A couple of um, landmarks um, from the Supreme Court, 2003, Lawrence versus Texas broke down sodomy laws that were again at a state level. Lawrence and his partner were an interracial gay couple. They were uh, actually arrested in their bedroom for consensual sex uh, because under Texas law that was considered illegal. Uh, and so this broke that down. The Affordable Care Act in 2010 not only includes insurance coverage uh, and hospital visitation rights were improved and some other rights for LGBT people. 2015, Obergefell versus Hodges was the marriage equality decision by the Supreme Court which legalized marriage equality nationally rather than as a state choice. And then of course 2022 was Dobbs and the um, revocation of Roe versus Wade in this country which has huge potential outcomes. What we see right now is the culture wars that are going on in many different states. More than 40 states have enacted legislation related to transgender um, affirming care, uh, drag performance, and other uh, considerations of other laws that are ongoing. We've seen reprimands of LGBTQ politicians and their allies in various state legislatures, and federal protections versus state rights is a huge argument right now. Um, and it's being fueled in many cases by the media and politics. Lastly, I just want to put up a few resources that are available for us. Um, GLAMA is the professional organization of the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association. Fenway Health is a healthcare system in Boston that does a lot of work in education. So if you're looking for resources for education, uh, this has some great um, CME activities available. Similarly, Whitman Walker in the Washington DC area. The Human Rights Campaign is an advocacy group, so it is a political action group uh, based in Washington DC, but it is national. They have a healthcare equality index. Basically, every hospital in this country is evaluated on that. And it would be great for you to look at your health system and know where you fall. When I started, um, we developed a committee at the University of Kansas. Um, we were probably, I think, at about 60 to 70 percent. This looks at patient um, care, uh, the rights of workers, non-discrimination policy, etc. Now I'm proud to say we are at 100 percent of meeting all of those criteria for helping LGBT care. Um, interestingly, anybody want to guess what one of the um, systems in the United States has almost always been at 100 percent? They were one of the leaders. VA, absolutely federal, yep. And so I go to the VA every Monday um, and they have been one of the leaders in that. And that's, that's really, I think, to be applauded. So um, a couple other things, Center for Disease Control has some good uh, material. The Trevor Project is a, an organization that's looking to try to help prevent um, teen suicide and looking at mental health in older adults. GLSEN is an education group, mostly for K through 12. Um, the um, GLAD, which is against defamation uh, of character, which is looking at advertising, at media, at entertainment, et cetera. And then Lambda Legal and the American Civil Liberties Union um, are legal organizations that help to work to protect our rights. Um, so with that, I'm gonna conclude, and we're going to again break into two groups, yeah. and I'll come and we'll talk really quickly um, because we're gonna have two different scenarios. So oh. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and I just wanted to add one thing Great talk, Dr. Kimberly. Thank you so much. I just want to add one thing, is that uh, based on the Household Pulse survey, more than half of LGBTQ Americans identify as bisexual. OK. Go ahead, Dr. Gribbling is going to break us up. It's going to give us two different scenarios. And this is a, a LGBTQ microaggression, and we can apply the vitals.
apologize. We only got six minutes, and I'm so sorry. Oh, they'll um, they give you. Let me see. Does Tomas have the thing in his hand? It was a slight advance. See if Tomas has it. Okay, guys, I'm going to. Um, I'm sorry, I know we're having a provocative discussion, um, and I apologize that we didn't have more time to spend. But for our last final minutes, which um, we'll give to Dr. Pamela Coleman from Howard University, again, we thank you so much for coming today. Thank you, Dr. McIntyre, and thank everyone for coming. I think that I can. Uh, get through actually to my main slide that um, we, I really want to talk about in terms of pipelines and urology. Okay. Could you bring up the pipelines and urology talk, please? It's Dr. Pamela Coleman. There you go. Thank you. Oh, he's still... Thank you very much. Um, I will actually try to get to the meat of the matter quite quickly. I don't have any disclosures. Um, actually, mine is not advancing. It's the green button. Yeah. Okay. There you go. I have no disclosures. Um, I have my learning objectives posted. And I really, I will just tell you in general, in preparing this talk, I, as usual, it's presented to learn more than probably you might remember yourselves. But. Um, in terms of my objectives, I was trying to find out what pipeline programs are there available out there in urology. So I was looking and sort of canvassing the existing pipeline programs. And to do this, I really went to the internet where everybody goes. My students go there. I said, why are you going to Dr. Google? I asked you the question, not Dr. Google. But I uh, went, went to it myself to, um, to, uh, to learn about pipeline programs in urology. So the goals here I have outlined um, how can we appreciate these pipeline programs? And I will say, in general, what do we need to know? You know, who, how do we uh, have a pipeline program? What, do we, what are we trying to accomplish? Uh, who's coming into the pipeline program? The capacity of the program? How many can hold? And the output? And and what do we? And why do we want this? Well, I will tell you, as I list, have listed here at the bottom, that there are many references that have found that there are better outcomes when we have diversity and inclusion in terms of urology, and it's so interesting that we're talking about um, uh, problems with um, healthcare. There's also problems with our students getting into urology programs. But certainly, if we can get underrepresented uh, students into urology programs, health outcomes have been shown to be much better, uh, better patient-doctor relationships, and there's also improved cost effectiveness. So I looked at the ACGME accredited specialties and subspecialties, and I will just say that in general, I picked out two neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery and compared them to urology. And you can see across the top header, if you look at the uh, Asian um, and then the second, third column, Hispanic, Latino, and then black or African American, and then white at the bottom, uh, the last column, and then you look at the representation, the students that chose these specialties, and then how many were actually of um, Asian or in neurosurgery, 21%, versus um, Hispanic, uh, Latinx, or of Spanish origin, 6.4%, or black or African, 5.1%. Uh, and you go down the column there, neurosurgery, orthopedics, and looking at urology, you see that the higher percentage are certainly in white applicants at 62.3%, and um, black or African American, 38 and uh, Latin X 6.5. Now, this information is from the 2019-2020 um, ACGME, but I would, it's very, very important, and we have here, if you can make sure that you do go and do the AUA census and that you really complete that, because that is where we're going to get this kind of information and be able to see what is going on with our within the AUA, um, American Urologic Association itself, and be able to determine these numbers and how we can improve. So I would just put a plug there and for completing the census. 
Um, pipeline programs in general, I mean, we all know that what their initiatives are to improve recruitment and retention for any particular program, case urology or professional area. So this is really the meat of the matter of the slide I wanted to get to. Um, is this the pointer? Is this the pointer? So what you see there, um, again, what I did actually was to, to go to uh, the internet and sort of look at the landscape of the pipeline programs that I found on the internet. And I'm just going to step down. Maybe I've, I can get my voice prepared. <laughs> but you see here that um, there's a look at these are the programs that I found. Now there may be more, I'm sorry if I missed too much further, but uh, that also itself is probably um, something we can look at in terms of how do we actually go and execute programs. Well, the first year I have the Arthur Stone Urology Institute, which this particular program is developed by urology. Thank you. 
Thank you for attending our course. Have a wonderful day and an even better AUA.